Okay, I'll, I'll get started. In uh, first, I would uh, hope my council uh, member colleagues uh, agreed that uh, the program has shown a lot of uh, successes, and this was very clear in the very first morning session before the break. In some areas, are quite unique to the program, and uh, I, I guess our discussion will be: Is, is it? Um, better to build on those strengths and uniqueness and to par partner with other programs for other areas or um, continue on a very global, very um, broad program as it, it seems to be. We, we saw uh, presentations on many areas. One thing that I particularly uh, didn't hear much but would like your opinion on is on implementation science. I, I think we heard pieces of it but we didn't see uh, or I didn't uh, clearly see an emphasis on that with expertise on that area and perhaps on psychological implications, um, even though we saw many uh, presentations or uh, discussions on ELSI uh, related to this, which, by the way, has been a, a great success. I mean, uh, not only from the papers, but also from the actual um, actions that have been done. Uh, besides that, in my area, I would say uh, it's important to consider what goes in the EHR, in the electronic health record, because that is the portion that the patients will control and will have access to legal, legally. So if it gets in there, they can take it out of there uh, and uh, disseminate with whoever they want. So you got to be uh, cognizant of what goes in there and of the limitations, do you want a BCF file, or do you want, do you want a BAM file, or what do you want in there, and the interpretation so that the patients can take out uh, to do what is called the blue button in our area, which is the button that the patient is supposed to click and get all the information uh, that is inside their electronic health records. Um, so those my, were my observations that escaped uh, the general discussion and again, emphasize that PCORI and other um, institutions are doing a lot of work in uh, building cohorts that could be potentially used uh, in combination with, with yours as well. I think that the emphasis on the clinical aspect on the implementation <coughs> at, the, um, at the clinic is, is unique and is very important. There are actually a couple people here that we've really uh, not heard much from uh, who are on council, and I'm going to uh, ask maybe if we could get some comments from them. So uh, I was going to start with Lon. Lon, would you could you give us some reactions and thoughts about how you think the day went? Has Lon disappeared? Ah, okay. All right. Okay. Um, Another person I had on that uh, who I hope hasn't disappeared is Wiley. Is Wiley Burke still here? There she is, yeah. Wiley, would you, would you be willing to give us some reflections and thoughts about what you heard about today? As a... So I, I just want to say I, I think it's been a great discussion, a really interesting discussion covering a lot of... Um, territory from my particular perspective and LC perspective focused on a few um, uh, issues that are very important to Caesar. I, I would say um, first and foremost, I think we have to take very seriously um, this issue of how we justify clinical sequencing and to whom we are justifying it and for what reasons. I'm following up a bit on what we heard from Naomi, which I think was a really important reminder uh, that we have resource-challenged healthcare systems, and we are proposing a very expensive new technology to be pushed into that healthcare system. And it really doesn't matter whether we're being asked to adhere to new standards versus how other technologies sneaked in 10 or 20 years ago. The reality is, um, to, to paraphrase something I've heard from a co colleague, if we can't figure out how to use genome uh, sequencing technologies in ways that are cost effective and generate better healthcare outcomes, they're not, those technologies are not going to be part of the healthcare system that any of us 
has access to. They're not going to be part of the benefits that our health care payers will pay for. So we have to take that very seriously, and I think that means we have to take a big breath uh, before we start really pushing the idea of the variety of personal and social benefits that might come from genomic information and take very, very seriously the um, enormous potential costs from cascade effects, particularly cascade effects related to VUS and VUS that are variously interpreted by different laboratories. Is it possibly pathogenic? Maybe not. One lab says it is, one lab says it isn't. All of the costs that flow from that are the kinds of things that our healthcare system can't afford and won't be interested in affording and put the enormous potential benefits of the technology at risk. The one other comment that comes up for me in terms of my work uh, is, is somewhat related. Um, we all agree that we want uh, more diversity in the participants in our research. We also want more diversity in our workforce. Uh, and um, we, we simply have to think hard and work hard to accomplish both those goals. Um, in terms of involving participants in research, diversity means um, a better efforts at involving populations that have traditionally been underserved and traditionally have less access to health care um, and less um, uh, ability to, to pay um, uh, co-payments or other costs that are involved, as we've heard very vividly from various people's testimony. Um, what, what my personal experience working uh, in particular with tribal communities on uh, genomic research suggests to me is that we have to move beyond um, general and sort of rosy pictures about what this technology can do and be very concrete and specific uh, about what we think are the real and tangible benefits from pursuing this kind of research and what the timeline is going to be, uh, as well, obviously, as respecting very carefully um, our, poten our potential partners' interest in sharing with us um, control of the research process. Um, and I think CSER is incredibly well positioned to think hard about both those challenges because we have such a diversity of expertise at the table and because we're really committed um, to, to clinical utility, ultimately. Thanks. Are there other comments? I mean, I, I, I had a couple of, of, uh, of um, reflections I'd like to make, um, part, partly uh, in the spirit of being very provocative, uh, which is I'm going to set up a, a completely straw man that I don't really um, believe is the case. Um, but it's a caricature, I think, to some extent, of how we in this field are viewed by people who are not in this field. And the caricature is that we are true believers who have already accepted that this technology is extremely important and is going to have a tremendous impact on health and on well-being and on medicine, and that it is extremely cool technology, and, and, and that we are whiners about people being unwilling to pay for it. And th that's, that caricature that I've just described, like a lot of caricatures, has certain elements of truth in it, but I think it also represents, um, uh, I think in some sense, a, a, a perception challenge that we have to overcome um, if this field is going to really move forward. Bob, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, I was just going to uh, follow up on, on um, bullet three about regulatory issues. And I think the people at NHGRI or people who know NHGRI well know this, but we have a division of policy, communications, and education, uh, of which I'm a small part. And uh, so if you do, in the process of, of working through these things, come across regulatory issues, um, please come to us, let us know about them. We can't guarantee we can do something about them, but at least we want to hear about them. 
need to turn on the mic. Okay. So one comment about the regulatory issues. I think um, there there was a, a question about what our thinking was in that space, and the, um, we we did this debate whether or not to make it a formal part of the session topics. And the reason why we didn't is because we, it's not because it's not important. We recognize that there is a lot of active, um, the active discussion actually between um, the FDA, for example, and some of the other NHGI programs. We, I think, chose to think of the agenda topics as sort of research topics focused for the next five to 10 years. I think the regulatory developments um, are important and we will certainly need to be abreast of them and keep our eyes open in terms of thinking about new opportunities. But the, um, the, the I think, research angle of it, um, the research angle of our, our uh, meeting today, um, I think, is what, what drove more our decision not to have it as a formal topic. But we, of course, recognize that we need to talk with our partners in the FDA and be aware of policies going forward. So I see Terry making a, um, a note here. Yeah, but there were others before. I was just going to say, but, but to the degree that, that CSER can identify issues that would, would help those agencies make regulatory decisions in, in what they've referred to as regulatory science, that's probably a useful thing for us to do and to incorporate. I agree. Deb and then uh, Pamela. So I'd like to respond to what the point that Bob made. And, and I think you're, you're provocative, but I think absolutely correct, although I wouldn't say everybody in this room is a convert, and I, can, I won't point to those that I know are not. Um, <clears throat> um, but I think that's why research on the value, the, the total package of what it means to do an exome or a genome for a patient the cost of the testing, the cascade, the value proposition, how it changes the quality of the patient's life, um, if there's a, a treatable uh, diagnosis, all the uncertainty that VUSs may create. I, I think understanding that within a system or a, a trial would, would be extremely helpful especially as we're moving toward healthcare reform and different payment models that unless something is valuable, it's not going to be paid for and, and improves the quality of care and the cost effectiveness of care. So I don't know if there are creative ways to think about funding that would do that, but um, I think that's extremely important. So we move from being uh, you know, the, the true believers to either having the evidence or having to relook at our belief of this is, you know, the be all and end all. Um, Pamela Sankar, University of Pennsylvania. Um, I just want to reiterate something that I think has been said a lot, but maybe it needs to be repeated. Sorry? Back up. Back up. All right. How's that? Move it a little closer. A little closer. <laughs> is, that, is that good? That's good? I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Quality Actually, I'm shrinking. Is happy. How's that? I don't know. How's that? How's that? How's that? All right, don't let me move, Deb. OK. Uh, I want to repeat something that uh, has been said several times, but I think it bears repeating. And that is that this is a very important moment for CSER and NHGRI to take seriously the need to integrate um, a broader diversity of populations, which I know we've talked about. My point is specifically that what we need to think about are the innovations, the practical innovations and requirements by which that is going to happen. This is a group that has a lot of goodwill, and I believe most of everybody sitting here really would like to see that happen. That's also been the case for as long as I've been around NHGRI. And I think that what needs to happen is it can no longer be uh, a desire in an RFA or in a program that it would be good if people integrated um, more diverse populations. It needs to be a requirement on which people are evaluated, which it hasn't been up till now. And I think that a lot of work needs to go into thinking how we're actually going to put that into RFA language or whatever language needs to, it needs to be integrated in because if we don't, in five years, we're all going to be standing here having the same conversation again. I have a Heidi and then Bob and Debbie. Okay. So I, I just want to comment back to Bob, your question about, you know, we as geneticists all embrace this. And, you know, I think one thing that's happened is 
the technology has allowed our sequencing, clinical sequencing space to swing from a very narrow focus in single gene sequencing to this like complete other end of the spectrum where we're looking at everything and we're looking to return secondary findings and and now this question of the cascade of what happens on that end comes up. And at some level you can liken it to the radiology world where screening CAT scans and screening MRIs were put into place and clearly people have backed off from those approaches recognizing the cascade effect as, as Naomi pointed out. But one wouldn't argue, or we certainly wouldn't argue that CAT scans aren't very useful in a diagnostic setting as are MRIs, as are x-rays. And I think we need to swing that pendulum back to the middle somewhere and say there are settings, lots of them, in which diagnostic sequencing today is incredibly beneficial. But we need a little more guidance and thoughtfulness to what it is we're returning. And we, need, we as a community, as Caesar and the broader community need to get together and figure out what's appropriate to return in a clinical setting versus what really is still in the research realm and we need to study it a little more and figure out penetrance and risk and things like that before we're ready to give it back. And so I, I don't want us to get burdened with the criticism because we've swung too far to the right and not recognize that somewhere in the middle is a pretty clinically useful tool. And I, I think we have to, but we as a community need to get back there, and I don't think we're quite there yet. Hey, uh, Bob, and then Stephen, and then Debbie, is that right? Oh, and then Robert. Okay. Um, just to, I, I think it's been Im implied today, but then question and answer to Deborah's point about, um, you know, trying hard to, to, uh, to, to document this, that, that to not, um, to start paying attention more to the comorbidities as opposed to the primary diagnosis. Um, so the primary diagnosis you may not be able to change, but you may be able to at least document changes in uh, comorbidities, uh, not only with the patient, but with the family. You know, um, Steve Jaffe from UPenn. Uh, the summary here of the sessions was a great summary and captured you know, many, most of the questions that were raised over the course of the day, but I think it was very much at the level of the trees or you know, the, the, the individual questions as opposed to like, what are the big picture forest level questions that if there's going to be a follow on program to Caesar, what are those big questions that need to be answered? And I hope we can spend some time talking about really the big questions that really ought to organize uh, the initiatives going forward. I, you know, just to throw some things that I've that I've heard that I think are at that level. Uh, you know, to go back to you know, point Deborah was making a few minutes ago, but that others have addressed as well. Uh, what is the value for money, for effort, for all of that of uh, sequencing? Uh, and and related to that, I think what's the value of a more broad versus a more parsimonious or targeted approach to the use of the technology? Um, how do we best implement sequencing into clinical arenas so that it actually fits into clinical workflow, into clinical practice? Those are the sorts of big picture questions that I think might be uh, the things to organize uh, a program around. And under that, there'll be lots of specific questions to address. But I think focusing on what are the big organizing principles is probably, the, to me, the most important thing uh, that I, I hope will come out of this meeting. That is what I was hoping would come out of this end of the day session. So that's great. So mm -hmm. uh, you know that's a that's a perfect setting, and I think that uh, several people have mentioned <clears throat> precision medicine, and actually Caesar is a test bed for precision medicine because it is applying. They you know you're talking about the diversity of problems that are being looked at by clinical sequencing. This is what you would look at by clinical sequencing. As Robert showed, there was just one area that wasn't covered in CSER. And they, everyone is looking at implementation, is looking at cost, looking at effectiveness. I mean, this is an inherent part. I, I, so I think it's really good to look at all of those and the broadness of what we're doing and if it should become even broader. I don't know, but it certainly needs to become more diverse. Uh, the one thing I'd like to bring up, too, is the variance of unknown significance. We have large-scale genomic profiling capabilities now that perhaps have brought along with CSER to look at these variants, prioritized variants of 
unknown significance would push them. I mean, years ago, people used to push sequencing centers to sequence the really important areas. Turned out to be really hard, but they learned a lot about how to do well. Uh, and maybe this is a good way to push some of the large scale functional centers that are emerging to look at variants of unknown significance and function on a large scale. They won't want to do it because it's too useful. But, and of course, no, no, because utility sometimes means that you have to actually look at one variant rather than looking at 10,000 variants that you could do really well. But they may not be 10,000 variants that are really important. So I think that sort of tying some of these things would be really useful. I just wanted to bring that up. Robert, then Ken, then Barbara. Yeah, I just uh, trying to respond to your uh, visionary winers uh, idea. I think if you've spent a lot of time in the CSER meetings, you know that there's also a lot of really enthusiastic skeptics in there. So I'm trying to find the opposite of that, but which which is part I think of the process that the these slides are not quite capturing the process whereby LC is cross-cutting and integrated. The process whereby this iterative patient-facing uh, standpoint is balanced by the E in exploratory on the technical and biological side. The process where there's this implementation science um, emphasis uh, for things that are, reach, are ripening in terms of their clinical practice and the process of exploring new biological and technical endeavors. And I, I don't know why it's worked, honestly, because it, it's a lot of stuff going on at once. But I have to say, I think it's worked in CSER, and it's it's allowed us to make contributions that are greater than the sum of, of the individual parts. So um, that's really just building on Steve's, also Steve's idea of the big themes, and, and I would emphasize, the one thing I would emphasize in those slides that isn't quite written down there is the dynamics of these cross-cutting processes. So we've got, uh Ken was next, and then we have sure. Ian and Deborah. Sure, I'll follow up also on uh, Dr. Shafi's uh, encouragement to uh, think on, on a larger scale. I, I'm Ken Offit from New York. I, I'm here this week in Washington um, on playing the referee role, not the player role, because I'm on the CAP and will be here for the next two days. I, I guess it's really more cheerleader than referee role, right? get my sports right, uh, and then go over to the BSC for the NCI. So I'm, I'm saying this only to be positive, and I agree with what, uh, what was just said. I think that you all have done a, a remarkable job uh, at uh, taking us through the wilderness. Um, I, I, would, I would just comment, though, from the large-scale side, with 4,000 adults and 1,000 individuals on your chart um, and cancer centers and, uh, that are not the eminent cancer centers necessarily that are members of the consortium, but some of the other larger cancer centers will be publishing papers um, in, the next, uh, in the next months with uh, thousands of, uh, of uh, germline uh, data, with tumor data, that on the cancer side, just looking forward, you know, we're, we're talking about tens of thousands of germline, uh, large uh, uh, sequence data on capture from cancer centers at St. Jude's Memorial and, and, and Chicago and, and other, other of, of the centers that uh, aren't necessarily represented, although the centers here are the leaders. Um, and, and I think we've come a great way in looking at the germline uh, from the sort of toxic effluent waste of tumor normal sequencing to the treasure that we know that it is. Um, and uh, at, you're seeing at cancer centers this looking to Caesar to set the, uh, set the stage forward, uh, as you have done, uh, as we are all struggling on a, a regular basis with annotation. We've regressed, as you know, in the cancer centers from exomes to panels, and we will probably not go back to exomes and genomes uh, for just exactly the reasons that were discussed here today with Cascade. This is the future. Um, and I think that within the Caesar 2.0 is a wonderful opportunity of scale to test some of the hypotheses that are discussed here today um, in, uh, in a, in a uh, 
captured phenotypic uh, milieu, if, uh, uh, if, you, uh, if you will. So I, I guess that's really the major, uh, the major comment. I, but I, did, I, I would just reiterate uh, uh, my view, again, playing the referee role, and we'll say again uh, probably over the next couple of days, at what an extraordinary role all of you have played, um, as I think it was said earlier today, setting sort of the higher conscience uh, for all of us in this field, struggling with uh, all of the topics that have been discussed today. Better. Barbara, Ian, Deborah, Sharon, Jim. Great. Th thanks, Bob. Um, so, Barbara Koenig, UCSF. So, I've been um, also want to return the conversation again, maybe to some of the big conceptual issues following what Stephen Joffe said. And, um, and Bob, I appreciate your putting the whining, uh, you know, the whining straw man up there. Um, but I think one of the other things that we need to do at this particular point in time is use this as an opportunity to rethink the role of the embedded ELSI component of a project like Caesar and to really think about that moving forward and how to build it in. And I was just spending, today I just spent, uh, as I was listening, I was trying to make a list of the things that were important to think about moving forward. And one of the, the issues is that ELSI issues um, don't, they tend to be, some of them may be novel, many of them are recurring, whether they're solvable or not is an issue, but often they deepen over time or they constantly transform and need to be addressed in different ways. So the, the conceptual issues that I kept hearing over and over again was the conceptual issue of how the, the research clinical care divide has been troubled by this technology and especially the sort of regulatory formulas that we'd relied on are no longer working, so we have to rethink those. We've started doing that a little bit in CSER. I think it could be very much a part of CSER 2.0. Um, and one way to think about a piece of that, I think, is the issue of, well, managing the uncertainty of all of this is a piece of it, but the other issue is how much to move toward individualized care as opposed to guidelines. And then if we do move toward guideline-driven uh, um, clinical interactions, how, do we, how much do we leave up to individual choice in terms of individuals making decisions? We did a lot of research about that in, um, in CSER, in, at the beginning of CSER. But then how do we now, moving forward, think about setting defaults in the system for larger populations? Um, and then I guess my final point, Stephen Jaffe earlier said that it was important to, to remember that one of the things that Caesar has done that perhaps is different than some of the other more purely empirical um, NIH consortia like this is, is the issue of focusing on some of the normative and, and conceptual work. So I'm hoping we'll also be able to really continue doing that. And that's particularly important in terms of going back to the goal that Pamela um, just talked about the issue of how we're actually going to make sure that we do a good job of thinking about some of the issues of integrating social, dis social determinants of health into the genomic analyses. And I think we still need to do a lot more thinking about how to have conceptual clarity in the research designs that we create. Uh, and also conceptual, well, and then we also need a lot of very strong um, and careful work about how to get the right patients into the, into the databases. So just a few thoughts about, to reflect on. So I, I think I'll be brief because I, I think it was sort of echoed in, in what Ken and Barbara just said, but to me the forest, or beyond the forest, is the uncertainty. That's one of the big issues that echoes through all of these um, sub topics that we've been, we've been dealing with. And I think when I think of CSER, I think of it as contributing to clearing up some of that uncertainty or defining what those uncertainties are and variant classification. But CSER's strength to me is it's having its finger on the pulse of the patients and the clinicians and being able to translate that uncertainty in an effective way. We're never going to get rid of the uncertainty completely. We know, you know, one end of the spectrum with Mendelian disorders. That's a little clearer, but there are Mendelian disorders that are non-penetrant, and there are modifiers, and getting all the way to the ultimate possibility for this technology, which is using it in health, where most of the uncertainty will lie. I don't think we'll ever get rid of the uncertainty. We have to strive towards minimizing it, but I think where Caesar's strength is, is understanding those uncertainties and, and, and 
looking at how best to translate that to the populations that we're caring for, whether it be the patients, their families, the clinicians, um, the payers, whoever it should be. And I think that's where our strength and uniqueness really lie. Deborah, Deborah next. So I don't know if I'm getting too much in the weeds, but it seems that Caesar has done exome and genome sequencing, and so you have access to a cohort that's larger than any of the individual studies. And I, I think it might be interesting to see if Caesar could look at um, whether or not people with questions about um, uh, people with a gene mutation in a particular gene known to cause a disease, except some of them don't have symptoms and some of them do, to do pathway analysis around that genetic disorder to see what are the modifiers. And by doing this with Caesar's data and combining across studies to, to maybe look at uh, things that aren't exactly what was being studied, you may inform the million person genome uh, project and the kinds of issues that might come up as you try to look across the different cohorts and stuff. Um, so, I mean, it, it probably wouldn't take that much funding to do these kinds of analyses because they're all in silico. If you could in identify the cohorts and then ask whether they have symptoms or not, and then you'd have two cohorts to study um, for the pathway analysis. Sh Sharon, I had you next. Thanks for keeping track. Um, I, I, I just want to make I guess three brief comments trying to do the big picture view. First of all, I'd like to really echo what Heidi said. I know Heidi and I wind up being on a lot of committees together, but I thought her points that I think we've gotten lost in the weeds, the fact that we're, what, three years into what might be a really good diagnostic test for many indications should not be overlooked. We are really at the beginning of knowing what indications it's good for. Um, and so I, sometimes we think, okay, that question's answered when, I mean, we've been looking at lipid profiles for decades, figuring out the best way to do that. Uh, the second is that I, I don't think we are all believers. I think there are some fundamental questions. Like at my heart, I'm not convinced that incidental finding reporting is a good thing. Um, and I don't know that it's a question that we've really answered, given all of the downstream testing and our lack of knowledge of the attributable risk of those mutations, et cetera. So I do think there's some very big questions around genome scale testing that CSER is very well situated to answer, both in further longitudinal follow-up of our original cohorts, but also in really thinking creatively about different different ways to report exome or genome scale methodology. I mean, the ACMG guidelines are just a guideline. We're actually not required to follow them. Um, and uh, I think there are still many unanswered questions about the best way to do genome scale testing in a clinical scenario. So my comments are echo a lot of what Sharon and Heidi said. I, I would just add that, that I think we all agree that looking at some aspect of clinical utility is, is vital. Um, something that Katrina Armstrong and I have been talking about here is that saying, okay, let's check the clinical utility of genome sequencing, it's a little like saying, let's examine the clinical utility of the MRI. Well, that doesn't make any sense, right? It, it has clinical utility in certain contexts and it has none in other contexts. And what we still have to do in our field is we have to figure out in what clinical scenarios this really makes a difference in patients and document that. And I think we also, I'm hoping that with a, a Caesar 2.0, if it, if it materializes, that we wouldn't be tied to having to do whole genome or whole exome sequencing. In other words, comparing when a whole exome approach um, it, it adds something or doesn't add something to panels. Um, would make a lot of sense. As we just heard from Ken Offit, um, people are not doing whole, whole exome or whole genome sequencing looking for germline mutations, and they shouldn't be because all of our experience shows that it really adds nothing. Those are the kind of things we need to find out, but we can't take a gauzy approach to saying, well, let's just look at whole genome sequencing. I, I think we need to be smarter about it. 
Gail? Um, so uh, similar to some of my fellow co-PIs, I, I mean, I think when we went in to see Sir One, um, there was a very broad, like, get the genome to the clinic, find out when it works, when it doesn't work, what the obstacles are, overcome those obstacles, and, you know, try and measure outcomes. And it was very broad. And as I reviewed the publications that we've had to date, two-thirds of the publications from my site, which includes the workgroup papers, of course, um, were never anticipated. They're not aims of the grant. They're problems that came up that we put together a group of very smart people across this consortium to address and were able to come up with uh, thoughts about or solutions to. And I think this field is moving so fast, we can't anticipate what all the questions are going to be. So we need a big framework of questions, but we need nimbleness as well. And we do need that core of really talented people who are thinking hard about this. John? Jonathan Berg, UNC Chapel Hill. Um, I'm going to try to answer what Dan wrote and asked us to do early, which is to try to point out where Caesar is different and distinct and has, has its own sort of place in this ecosystem of genomic medicine. And I, I think that it's because we complete the link between the patient, their clinical provider, the lab, and then back. And I think we complete that circuit. Um, I think it gives us the opportunity to, to do novel work with communication to the patient of what the testing can accomplish, what it can't accomplish, what are the benefits and the risks, um, all those aspects of it. Um, it allows us to look at some questions about how the clinical laboratories and the physicians have to work together in a sense collaborating on the analysis to figure out what is the, the relevant variant here. Um, how that information then gets communicated back via the provider to the patient, and it can be a medical geneticist, it can be a, a primary care physician, and, and, and really exploring a lot of those things gives us a chance to, to really make an impact in terms of the communication analysis and, and then incorporation into clinical care. And I think that's where Caesar hits the sweet spot and is really critical. Bruce? Thanks, Bruce Cord from UAB. <clears throat> a few things uh, that occurred to me just listening to the conversation today. One is we heard a very powerful description of the power of networking among patients. And I guess I would also add networking among our colleagues in medicine. One of the things, for example, that we heard about the um, DOPA responsive dystonia story, that is really not such an obscure neurologic disorder, but I don't doubt that it fails to get diagnosed a lot of the time. And one of the things that struck me as we look at exome or genome sequencing is every once in a while you make a diagnosis that you kind of kick yourself afterwards and say, why didn't I think of that? And the answer is usually you're at the end of a long line of people who didn't think of it. And so it's occurred to me that we ought to be trying to push the experience that we have with some of these disorders back into the clinics and, for example, search for in clinics of people with, with um, dystonia, just for one case in point, for individuals who should be tested, not maybe have their genome sequenced, but tested for conditions that are either ultra rare or just somewhat rare that we come to realize are explaining some of the phenotypes that had prompted the diagnostic odyssey. So short-circuiting that odyssey may not only occur by sequencing all these people, but also by improving the communication to neurologists and radiologists and all the other specialties who see these patients so they think of these diagnoses more quickly than they currently do, and not just by publishing them, because I agree that people are buried under a pile of unread manuscripts. So coming up with clever ways to push differential diagnosis closer to the point of care, I think, uh, would be one lesson that the CSER and other genome sequencing projects may be able to impart. A second point is that I think I've heard a lot about trying to interpret individual variants in terms of their phenotypic significance, and I certainly appreciate the complexity of that, but it also occurs to me that they don't act in, I in isolation, and do we need to be thinking of constellations of variants? And I don't mean by that you know, thousands, I mean two or three even, that maybe the reason why you don't get the expected phenotype from one particular variant is that it happens to conspire with one or two other variants that are sitting there. And so we need to think in terms of combinations, I think, not in terms of, of individual variants. 
A third point um, gets to what I guess is the glass half full view of the cascade issue, which is maybe it's not such a wise thing to, to see a variant and then embark on a, a new odyssey looking for a phenotype in somebody who isn't obviously affected. On the other hand, though, it'd be nice to think that there's a way that the genomic information can live somewhere in the medical record so that maybe even years later, when a person appears with a new symptom and somebody's trying to figure out why it's there, that the genome sequence is still at their disposal to help inform the differential diagnosis. And although I don't think that that is good, I think that actually will ultimately decrease costs for that individual, but it needs to be done in the context of their phenotype, not just in isolation as a consequence of the variant. And I guess the fourth thing is that with all the concerns about costs, it, it seems to me that the cost of actually sequencing continues to be on a downward trajectory. The cost of interpretation, a lot more complicated, and the cost of counseling, complicated too. And I guess the question is, how can we squeeze the costs out of some of those other aspects, as people are trying to do, squeezing the costs out of sequencing? For example, is the paradigm of the physician and or counselor in a room with a patient talking about one thing at a time, which might be argued to be the gold standard of how counseling is done? Is that the way of the future? Are there ways of doing this more quickly and efficiently and at much lower cost using tools other than face-to-face -face interaction uh, for each individual who needs counseling. So looking at new ways of imparting, interpreting information, I think, is another opportunity. We have uh, Levi, and then I'm going to actually call on former and current uh, members of councils. I'm going to ask Rex to make some comments, and also Dan. But Levi, I think you were next. Thanks. Yeah, so the, just thinking through, again, the, um, the, the allergy to genomics and genome medicine that's actually out there. Uh, and actually, it's both in the basic science and the clinical side and how to, how to approach that from a healthy skepticism. Or even if, if I believe something, I'm open to, you know, change my beliefs. So, and I guess one way to think about it is, so we, we, we've gotten accustomed to using the term genomic medicine in various contexts. And maybe we should, we should eradicate that term and just talk about medicine. And and medicine, and I think imaging has been a great analogy because, of course, you know, when you, when you do a, an abdominal CAT scan and somebody has retrocultural pain, you don't just do a scan of the, of the um, you know, gallbladder, you do a scan of the entire abdomen, and, and often you throw that away. But so, so I think to a certain extent, it does, genomics is a, a complex technology like imaging, as Heidi said, that has a lot of applications, but in the end, we don't necessarily want to make the same mistakes that were made, uh, and actually they weren't mistakes at the time because it was just kind of a luxury of just having imaging proliferate to the point where we're so oversaturated and people are just reflectively sending all kinds of uh, images and we have to now kind of scale that back because the costs were insurmountable. So if we were able to actually um, be smarter and be able to say, all right, well, we, we've picked the, the questions or the diseases or context or what have you, and if, if in the end what we end up having is a mature clinical management pathway or maturing clinical management pathways where we actually understand where genomics is useful and where it's not and whether it's an exome or whether it's something smaller. And we, we just sort of say that's, what, that's our goal. Our goal is just to figure that out. It's not to sort of say, oh, everybody's going to have their genome sequenced or it's, it's genomic medicine. We're starting, which implies that we're starting with the premise that the genomics is of paramount importance. We're just trying to say this is obviously an exciting tool, but um, we recognize that it may well be that in the majority of medicine we don't use it, or at least we don't use it right away until well down the pathway. But that's okay. I mean, it, I think it'd be a victory if we ended up with, if we saw that the way that clinical pathways emerged was that in many cases it was obvious uh, in the decision tree when and how to use uh, you know genomics, but recognizing that it, it, in many cases it's not going to be useful, that would be okay. And that would be sort of, I think it would still be a huge uh, contribution to society if, if we took that approach. Rex, would you be willing to step up? Yeah, 
Yeah, I'm Rex Chisholm from Northwestern. Um, I guess I, my thoughts fall into a few categories. Um, w one, I think, uh, thinking about this whole idea of, and I'm going to use the word genomic medicine, although you can ignore the genomic part if you want, um, because, and it's come up several times today, one of the things that CSER is doing very well, I think, is generating evidence for the value of genomic medicine. Uh, it's doing it in a, you know, case-by-case -case basis, but that's probably about the best way you can do it, is a case-by-case -case basis. And I, I worry a little bit about how well that scales, but I think when we're always asked, well, what's the evidence that genomic medicine works? I think we can point to a lot of the things that Caesar's learning and saying there is evidence here that genomic medicine is, is, is really working. So I think just keeping uh, the development of that evidence is an important part of what we need to be doing going forward. Because when I talk to people, so I guess I'm a true believer, but when I talk to people, one of the, uh, my colleagues in general internal medicine at Northwestern, you know, they're not all true believers, and they, they're skeptical, and what they keep saying is we don't have enough evidence. And so I think I'm focused on the evidence piece, and again, I, I think I've said Caesar does that really well. The other uh, area where I've thought about, and, and I guess this sort of falls into uh, what Jonathan was just addressing, which is sort of what's unique, but where does it overlap with the other programs that NHGRI has, um, you know, of course, as somebody that comes from Emerge, I'm constantly thinking about uh, how this might overlap with Emerge. There certainly are some things that uh, overlap, and it, it, in just the last set of discussion has uh, turned my mind in a curious way. I, I think uh, it, it would, might be fair to say, and my Emerge colleagues that are here could uh, agree or disagree with this, but I think Emerge has had sequence envy of Caesar. Um, and continues to have sequence envy of uh, Caesar because in Emerge 3 right now, at least it looks like for the near future, we're going to be doing a panel. So I was really struck by hearing that um, Ken said that on the cancer side, they've regressed to doing panels, so maybe I should give up my sequence envy. Um, but I, I think to think about the implementation and the, a real opportunity to compare the you know, sort of whole sequence approach that uh, Caesar is taking with sort of the more panel approach that Emerge is taking, uh, I think provides a really oppor a nice opportunity to think about experiments, uh, just a, an experiment. How do those two compare going forward? We're both implementing, we're both putting stuff back in electronic health records. I think uh, there's a nice overlap. The groups that are doing electronic health records implementation on both have already collaborated, collaborated really well. Uh, I think we've seen similar kinds of collaboration on, on the ELSI side. But I'm struck about this difference between sequence and, and panel. So maybe that's something we should think about embracing the similarities here, but also uh, taking advantages of the differences uh, going forward. So I guess those would be my, my main thoughts. Dan? Could, uh I really have very little to add to sort of what's been said today and what, what, what Jonathan and, and Rex have just said. I think the, um, as I've said sort of in side conversations through the day today and before, if you'd asked me three or six months ago, it was not very clear to me what, what you know, what Caesar would add to what Emerge was going to do. Uh, now that we're sort of uh, starting to put our, our, our foot in the water, not, our, not just our toes with respect to sequencing and emerge, it's totally clear to me that uh, the things that have to be done in order to interpret and then deliver back to patients the information that we're going to generate with our panel in emerge and that you have generated with various panels across CSER it, it needs a huge amount of work and, and the emerge centers are just not equipped or set up or have the bandwidth to do all the things that need to be done. And you've heard through the day about uh, uh, specific experiments that, that Caesar, you know, is doing and should be doing in the future. So I, I, th I think that it, I've come away from this day with an absolute conviction that there is a role for, a big role for, for, for Caesar too in still understanding the relationship between an individual patient a, uh, a, sequence, a sequence variant and, and the healthcare system. 
Uh, and and I, and I really uh, resonate with what Heidi said as well, that, that um, this technology is so new that everybody in this room sees all the problems. And, uh, and I think we, this is human nature. I think people, people do this all the time. They, uh, I get asked about arrhythmia things, and I sort of take for granted that everybody knows what I'm talking about, whereas, in fact, most people are just not familiar with, uh, with the, the potential uh, that this technology can play in the care of real live patients. And so you have to not lose sight of that by drowning yourself, or we have to not lose sight of that by drowning ourselves in the potential problems as we go forward in this you know, technology that changes every six months. So, so uh, clearly there is a role for exome sequencing, for genome sequencing in people with uh, difficult to diagnose Odyssey, uh, diagnostic odysseys. Deborah and I have been exchanging lists through the day today of diseases that are often overlooked until they get to the 12th doctor. And we have a list of somewhere between six and 12 diseases so far. And so, so, so those are the kinds of things that, that we need to emphasize, perhaps not to NHGRI staff or to council, but to the broader community as you sort of start to, to say where does this technology fit in. Not to oversell, but not to undersell as well. I'm going to uh, turn to Sarah, but I also would like two other council members who haven't commented yet at the end of the day, Amy and Shanita, if you'd be willing to make some comments after Sarah. Um, Sarah Scullin, Baylor College of Medicine. So I just wanted to speak a little bit to the genetic counseling aspects and hopefully answer somewhat your questions regarding the psychological aspect of it. Um, so I think uh, one thing that we've learned, a lot of our um, initial work has been done on informed consent um, through the project that was led by Barbara Bernhardt. One of the things we learned in that project was that once we started returning results, that taught us something about um, how we should do the informed consent. And so I think now our next steps is really moving into looking at the return of results process. Um, but Downscale, I think one thing we really need to look at is the actual patient understanding of this information. So we have our perception of how well the patients are taking in this information, but I think it's really important for us to actually ask them um, what they are taking from this, what they're going home and telling their family members, what they're going home and telling their doctors. And so I think we're in a good place to do that. Um, and also speaking to, because as we do all of this, I think we streamline each of these steps. And I do think that there, because of the lackage of genetic counselors, we are going to have to look at ways where maybe genetic counselors aren't doing all of these pieces. And so things like virtual genetic counseling have come up. But I think that we need to really figure out which of these areas genetic counselors are most important, where their role is significant, and where are some areas where um, some adjust adjustments can be made. But I don't think it's really until we streamline each of these steps that we can determine that um, and what should go into things like a virtual genetic counseling. So, um, but I think going back to the communication piece, that Caesar really is in a unique position. Um, I will say in the genetic counseling community, we are probably the largest group of counselors who have given back these types of results. There's, you know, there's some clinics that still haven't touched this test. Um, and even with the informed consent information, the, the genetic counseling community was really hungry uh, to hear what we had to say about it. I think the same will happen for return of results. So um, that's just a little bit about the genetic counseling piece. Amy? Amy, Amy and Janita, and then Barbara after, after them, okay? Is that all right? Thanks. Yeah, so um, first of all, I think this has been a really, really fantastic day. Um, I can say uh, similar to, I, I guess, I forgot who just made that comment, um, uh, but Seth, maybe Dan made the comment, but similar to Dan, I would say that before this meeting, as a CSER grantee, I was like, yes, there should definitely be a CSER 2.0, but as a council member, I was kind of like, I'm not 100% sure, and I think the, the question that kept getting floated by is what is Caesar's sort of unique contribution and what do they add to all the other consortium? And I think after today, I'm fully convinced that there is a, there's a real role for Caesar 2.0 and that there is a unique contribution um, that we have been making and that we continue to make. Um, and I think that really centers around the generation of evidence. Um, and it's really interesting because First of all, as somebody who does the project three, the LC component of it, a couple of, of observations. One is that 
Um, this has been a really unique and fantastic opportunity to embed LC within the larger context. And I've worked on several embedded projects. I think this is one of the most, um, probably the most successful one in terms of how it's gone um, and in terms of the contribution that that part of the project has made. Um, and it's also been a little bit of an expanded um, view of traditional LC research, and it's, it's kind of moved some of us, or at least me, over more into the, um, to the outcomes side of, of LC, which has, has been a, a neat experience and also very valuable, I think, for the work that we do in terms of thinking conceptually and normatively about some of these issues. Um, my personal experience has been when we started the project, I really thought that the whole point of the project was to figure out, A, can we do it? Can we actually integrate genomics into the, the clinical context from a technical you know, perspective? And B, what are the risks involved? And I think there was a lot of concern about psychosocial risks and things like that, and we focused a lot on that. And as we move towards a CSER 2.0, um, I think I'm at least shifting to, yes, we can do it, and sort of the question now is how do we do it better? Um, and then from, from the outcomes perspective, I think there's, um, we've gotten a lot of data about risk, and it hasn't actually shown that there's tremendous risk, although that's, of course, a more nuanced answer than I just gave. Um, but really, the main question now moving forward is, what is the value, and really a focus on value? What's the utility, and for whom, and in what circumstances? And I think that's a really interesting, challenging, and important question that needs to be answered. I think we're starting to answer it now um, in the projects, but I think we're just sort of I would say in the hypothesis generating phase, and I think that we really need to start um, to move that forward. So I think it's a really exciting time, actually, and, and look forward to what we continue to do. Sure, thank you. So I would just echo the positive comments that have already been made about the significant progress the consortium has made in terms of um, several issues, one of which is developing uh, models of informed consent under different clinical scenarios. I think that's been really important and um, is a really useful model that can be applied more broadly within the um, genetics and genomics research. I also think um, CSER has been really effective in terms of developing and impl implementing a model for um, conducting embedded LC research. I think that um, the way in which it's been addressed and the way in which the group has worked effectively um, to ensure that LC issues are, are incorporated and, um, and, and executed and studied appropriately is really important and, and very useful. I also think that um, CSER has been really effective at um, identifying key psychosocial and behavioral outcomes as part of the um, LC portfolio research, and I think the work has the group has worked um, very effectively to integrate these outcomes across the consortium. And having seen consortia that haven't worked really well, I think that's um, on sort of these issues. I think it's a really testament to the um, synergy and cohesiveness of the group. That's really important. I'm really pleased to see the, um, the data and the, on recruitment and retention of ethnic and, and racial minorities. I'm really excited and um, that, this, that this issue, which was raised at the last meeting, has um, been um, addressed in a very forthcoming and direct way. Um, I look forward to seeing what will happen next in terms of actually learning from the lessons um, within the consortium as well as in the general field of minority recruitment and retention in other settings and how um, this consortium is, will think about and develop strategies to actually develop some concrete solutions that um, are, have a, the potential to increase the diversity of, sam of the sample populations. One of the things that I haven't heard mentioned a whole lot is what happens with these results in families in terms of how, do, how are they discussed with family members and what understanding, understandings and misunderstandings do family members have about them. And in particular also with regards to the children and adolescents, what happens with the results for them um, and what support, if any, may parents need as they 
begin to discuss some of these uh, results with families. I bring this up because I was reading a transcript from one of our uh, return of results sessions in which the mother said to her 18-year-old daughter, you know, sit up and pay attention. This concerns you as the daughter's holding the copy of the report. And she says, what am I supposed to do with this? And, and it occurred to me, what is she supposed to do with this? And do we know what happens with these things in families? And how is this information kept and stored and shared with the PCP? And what is the role, in fact, of the primary care provider for acting on uh, results both relating to the underlying diagnosis and also to some of the secondary findings, particularly with regard to pharmacogenetic findings if those are returned, and also carrier status findings. Um, so, Gail Henderson again, um, and I'm going to be real short. Uh, I loved what Chanita said. I almost didn't get up because a lot of what I want to say reflects things you just said. But I, want, I wanted to introduce a little historical perspective because um, the LC program went through a bit of a crisis maybe five years ago, and um, it wasn't quite clear where it was going. Um, and one of the things that's happened during this time has been embedding LC projects in a number of different consortium. And, and to a certain extent, I think this has redefined and rejuvenated um, what, we, what you all think, certainly what most of you in this room think LC means. It isn't actually, it's not the LC of my grandmother. <laughs> actually not, it's, it, it isn't, but I think it's, I think it's very appropriate that now psychosocial measures, behavioral outcomes, I would say health economics as well. Um, I know it's not the um, PC, but I would say that all is under an umbrella of thinking about social implications. Um, and I also want to say one other thing, and that is I've always thought of LC as, as thinking broadly about justice as well as thinking about autonomy and beneficence. Um, and I think I am most thrilled by today's, it seems to me, train that's now, I think, firmly left the track um, uh, with an engine of genomic necessity that means that um, now people who are non-Europeans are going to constitute a lot of the patient populations who are recruited into studies. It just has to happen. That's really just, and it's scientifically valid. It's scientific, a scientific imperative. So I think that some of the things that I've most admired, Elsie, um, Elsie, the ELSI program that Wiley runs, and others as well, about justice with health disparities, it's going to come out of uh, if there is an ELSI 2.0. And I think that's just brilliant. So thank you. That's the train leaving the station, not, not leaving the track, I hope. Oh, no. <laughs> not perfect. <laughs> Hi, Greg Fierro, Maine Dartmouth Family Medicine Residency. And I apologize, I've been fairly reluctant to get up and say anything because I was sort of an insider and then I'm squarely an outsider. But you know, I think a number of things uh, through the day for me were quite striking. The first is where NHGRI and the genomics community is now in comparison to where it was 10 years ago with regard to coming to grips with some of the clinical implications of the technology as they emerged. And it's really quite remarkable where I think it was, if you know, Joe's not still here, at a niche peg meeting about a decade ago I attended, um, someone came up to me after I gave a talk for NHGRI and said, you people, you're just like the big ship going through the ocean and creating all these dead fish, and you don't deal with the dead fish. It was a really funny analogy, but I think we're, we're, dealing, we're dealing now with the dead fish, basically the technology moving forward and creating a clinical challenge in its wake um, in a structured way, which is fantastic. So that's great. So um, the other part of me says we still have a long way to go to move the primary care community with what I've heard today. Um, in several respects. One is that the evidence it sounds like Caesar is generating um, is powerful and anecdotal regarding rare disease, um, and to some extent more common conditions, but largely still in the realm of rare, uh, rare conditions. Um, and until uh, the corner is turned um, to deal with common complex conditions that really motivate primary care's day-to-day -day living, um, I think it's going to be hard to garner their attention. 
One of the issues that struck me is Caesar, it seems like is powered well and equipped well with the, the really brilliant folks that are involved to answer certain types of questions about sequencing, but not well powered in terms of the number of people um, that have been sequenced and who have good phenotypic information to answer really other really critical questions. And so some way to sort of intersect some of the large cohorts that are being assembled and maybe already exist in some of the HGR other, other programs where there is the power to answer some of those questions with some of the great work that's going on in CSER would seem to me to make a lot of sense. The other issue that was striking to me was that we made it through an entire, basically two hours of discussion of analytic validity, clinical validity, and clinical utility. And until Bob Nussbaum mentioned positive predictive value, nobody had used a term that the standard evidence-based medicine world of internal medicine and family medicine usually thinks about um, um, in terms of describing the results of tests. And so I think there is still an issue of a, a language gap between the genomics community um, and an understanding gap between the genomics community and uh, some of the other areas of medicine that are pushed to population health perspectives on a day-to-day -day basis. And I know my family medicine colleagues every day are um, thinking along the lines of managing the population health of their panels, and that's really in the common complex disease world. And we care about positive predictive values, numbers needed to treat, numbers needed to screen, um, and those metrics. And so I would encourage the CSER investigators to try to involve folks from their primary care world. And I know Bob has done a lot of work. Um, um, Robert Green has done a lot of work in that in that domain, and it's a challenge to get primary care folks to attend and uh, provide input. But I think um, really to have this grow beyond um, um, the genomics and perhaps some of the folks in specialty areas that are interested in genomics at this point in time, you're really going to need to engage those folks and speak in their language. So anyway, it's been a great day. Thanks. Thanks, Bree. Hi, um, Mildred Cho at Stanford, and also as a member of the advisory panel, um, I just wanted to throw in my two cents as well. Um, I uh, appreciate what Heidi and I think Dan said about sort of the not throwing the baby out with the bathwater, um, but I also struck it struck me today that the Caesar program is still quite exploratory, and so I think another part of that not throwing the baby out with the bathwater is we can't assume that we already, we can't, we shouldn't assume that we know more than we know um, and that we actually are ready to do this at a clinical stage, in, in, at a clinical level. Um, you know, we did mention analytic validity, but I think there are a lot of issues that were brought up that sort of make it seem like we've assumed that we've got, we know what clinical grade sequencing is supposed to be. And I don't think, you know, I think we're, we're sort of jumping ahead with a lot of those issues. And I think with the exploration that we still need to do, we need to pay attention to the gaps, such as the um, racial and ethnic diversity. We, we can't assume that we know a lot there. Um, and so I would just urge that um, to sort of think about what it means to explore, and not just to explore under the lampposts, right? We need to broaden the light out and look in places where we haven't looked before. That also includes the ELSI parts. Where, and I think that that means thinking about what the limitations of an embedded model of ELSI is, because that kind of focuses things under the lamppost. I think we need to look beyond that. Brad? Yeah, Brad Ozenberger, WashU Genome Institute. Wow, what a big, a lot of big, a lot of big topics discussed today. Uh, but, but from a strategic planning standpoint, you know, I'm wondering how helpful we've been to NHGRI staff. And you know, as you, uh, one way to cope with that might be to, to kind of break this down, break it up, you know, to tackle some of these big issues maybe one by one. Um, but I just want to advocate, and others have said this too, that, that a, a big part of the success, I think, of CSER has, has been the interdisciplinary nature, you know, the project one plus project two plus project three. And you know, I want to advocate that, that, that that's something uh, that I hope will continue. No, I echo everything. I think it was a great day, uh, a lot of good ideas. What we were um, asked to consider 
is the, in the few minutes that are left, would be impressions regarding um, a consortium versus more independent projects and considerations about somewhat format as well as content. So <clears throat> the consortium format seems to be highly effective in bringing together groups of people with different perspectives. Um, but I think the um, smaller um, awards like the R1 that could almost be like the big co cooperative groups, RFAs for projects that relate to what the consortium is doing and maybe using their data to do other kinds of analyses um, might, it is still useful. Um, I don't know they have to be totally separate RFAs, but they could be related to Caesar's work and, and build on that um, in different ways. One of the aspects is how does the consortium change over time, or are you in it or not in it? And, and so that's an aspect to um, continuing with, a, with the consortium model. Yeah, I, th I just to follow up on that, I think that our consortium model has been surprisingly, at least to me, successful. Um, but I do think, and I've, I've argued for this within CSER, but uh, I'd, I'd like to put it out there for the larger group. I think we could be far more open to um, other partners from academics, other types of grants, other type of industry partners, uh, industry partners in the pre-competitive space through FNIH and other mechanisms. Than, than we have been in the past, and we could even further increase our influence by, by doing that. There are a lot of mechanisms for doing that that we can discuss uh, offline, but uh, I think that that's one way we could concretely further multiply the impact of CSER in, an, in a subsequent iteration. So I think as we move to closing up being aware of the time, I'm going to echo Brad's comment that you have given, I think, as quite a challenge in terms of processing and thinking about this. And I did, and I will appreciate that his advice, which is something I've been thinking about um, for most of the day, is, is how to break it down and where are the things to go. And that's certainly something that I think we're going to be doing a lot of over the next I don't know, weeks <laughs> as, as we discuss this. Um, but I do, I think, you know, one of the things that I'll take away is there is a lot of, of discussion, both in terms of really getting to the, the specific of that interface between the patient and the clinician that we've been talking about, but then there's also been a lot of talk about the learning health system and, and improving that and developing that, you know, and I think some of those are going to start to be axes where some of this is going to perhaps you know, be ways to break it down, and it's going to be interesting. Um, and also just to thank all of the speakers and reactors and moderators for doing such a wonderful job. And I'll, I'll just um, add to that that I'm, I'm very thankful for everyone's feedback today. I think we've heard a lot of ways that um, current CSER could sort of look at our consortium and make it better, and we've also heard a lot of ways in which CSER can sort of look outwards and, and make ourselves um, more relevant and um, really um, more strategically aligned with what's needed in, in genomic medicine. I, I do want to thank also the planning committee um, and the people who helped with the logistics, um, those people who tweeted, thank you very much, um, and then especially all of you here today. I do want to remind people that um, we will have a workshop report that includes the feedback um, that we've heard. We, we definitely want to uh, make good use of the feedback we've heard today and, and make that information available to the community. Um, I'd like to turn it now over to Eric Green for any closing remarks.